Genesis. We thank you for the gift of your word. We thank you for the gift of your sacraments. And we pray that as we gather together today to share the word and to nourish ourselves in that light to help us and to draw us closer to you. Grant this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So, once more, good morning to you all. Good morning, Father. Just to continue, it's a singular privilege for me to be among you here today, and I find myself humbled to be addressing so great intellectuals before me. I don't know what to say among you right now. Uh, I feel I'm not good enough to be before you right now because I'm talking to intellectuals. I'm talking to people who have learned all the big books, who have the degrees and all that. But well, in the sight of God, all of us are learning. And so whatever I'm going to be saying here today, I'm just going to facilitate our sharing of God's word. Before I came, a topic was given to me to prepare something to tell you. I, today we shall be meditating briefly on walking with Jesus Christ. Walking with Jesus Christ. And I'm going to look at it from my own limited point of view. Inspired, I think, by the Holy Spirit. And to begin, I would like us to open up. For those who have Bibles, if you have, fine. If you don't have, just follow. What you can do, you can take down the quotations. When you go back home, you can read them. And refresh yourself. And renourish yourself. So, in that light, as a walking text, I would like us to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. In the second letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, for a while of time, I will not ask people to read, I will just go ahead and read. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, and what does St. Paul say there? For we walk by faith and not by sight. For we walk by faith and not by sight. It is so providential that this morning the gospel ref reflected on faith. We looked at the faith of Bartimaeus who came to Jesus Christ who stole the show and asked Jesus Christ to heal him and Jesus Christ made him well. And so we are asking ourselves what does it actually mean to walk with Christ? Walking with Christ is designed to encourage us as Christians by presenting the truth that transforms. So as we gather as one family, we are asking ourselves, what is it that can really make us to come closer to Christ? What is it that can make us to become better individuals? Because if you've never known, there is only one reason why we are alive. There is only one reason why we are alive. And you know that reason? What's the reason? Can somebody tell you please? Come again. One, one person to, to serve God. Serve God. Yes, that's partly the answer. But truly, the only reason why we are alive is because we have not finished our mission here on earth. That's the only reason why we are alive. Because we have not finished why God made us. When we were doing catechism, when we were doctrine, as infants, they taught us, when they asked us the question, why did God make you? And the answer is simple, God made me to know him, to love him, to serve him, and finally to be happy with him forever in heaven. Amen. So as individuals here present, we are here because we want to know God, we want to serve God, we want to be happy with him in heaven, not on earth. So our true happiness cannot be found here, only in heaven. And so that's why we are asking ourselves, how can we walk with Christ? Another quotation which we are going to reflect on will be from the book of the prophet Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 3, verse 7. And what does Zechariah say? Thus says the Lord of hosts, if you walk in my ways and heed my charge, you shall judge my house and keep my thoughts, and I will give you access among those standing here. Only when we walk with the Lord shall we have what we desire on earth. There is this song which is very common. Um, this uh, Gregory and uh, those from Nigeria, you can follow me. 
the Gregory achieves the Mutaya, the male is the first time when we walk with the Lord. Can you tell me to sing that song, please? When we walk with the Lord in the night. The car is probably parked outside. So you walk out of bed, took a shower, cleaned up, walked to the car and started the car. The movement from the car, of the car from the house to church is a walk we are making. And it's a walk towards a direction. And so when we talk about the walk, we talk about change of place, a displacement from one place to another. So when we talk about walking with Christ, we are talking about taking that conscious step. There's a song to song, come on, don't mind a lot of songs. Walking with him step by step to the place of Jesus. Walking with me step by step to the place of Jesus. So we are walking step by step to the place where we meet Jesus. The Bible frequently contrasts the way in which believers walk as different from the way in or believers walk. Remember, I'm saying here, I'm not talking about the physical walk, I'm talking about the spiritual walk. The way Christians will walk and the way Christians will carry out their life is totally different from the way those who are not Christians are called upon to live. We as Christians who have chosen Christ have a different way to move. And this work indicates that believers have a different conduct, have a different way of life. So as individuals who are called to be Christians, wherever we are, in whatever we do, our own way has to be different from the rest of the world. That's what we are talking about here. When we walk, it entails a deliberate act in which we must leave the next, call it from a physical point of view, and move to another direction. And as we move each step, we get closer to that destination. So every day of our lives, we are supposed to get closer to Christ. If today you are not getting closer to Christ than you were yesterday, it means you have wasted today. 
Every day we should get closer to meeting our Lord. Every day we should get closer to the reason why God made us. And this we can only do by consciously examining our consciences every day. God gives us the opportunity every day to have time to sit down, to reflect and look at my life. Okay, today, I am of today. What is it that I've done new to myself? What progress have I made in my spiritual journey? What is the thing that has changed in my life? How have I become a better individual? Working with Christ encourages us in the daily life. And the main goal, therefore, of this movement is to develop a deeper and a closer relationship with Christ. In working with Him, we develop a clear understanding of how Jesus worked on earth. We develop a clearer understanding of the relationship between man and God. We develop a closer relationship between who we are and who we are called to be. And I, in the course of looking at this work with guys, I decided to pick out a few aspects that we can meditate on to help us to understand how we can work better with Christ. And the main areas that comprise our working with Jesus Christ, first, is the Word of God. Second is prayer. And third is an emphasis on a growth in maturity towards our Christian life and conduct. The Bible is the central source through which God's Spirit speaks and influences our lives. Only through the Bible can we become better individuals through God's Word. Why God communicates with us by means of the scriptures, we also have a great privilege of communicating with him in prayer. He talks to us in the scriptures, but we communicate with him in prayers. Prayer works. If you've never understood, no prayer works. I stand as a testimony to working of prayer in my life. If I want to start giving you the testimonies I've had, for this very short time I lived on earth, there are so many. But in the course of talking, I'll give you a few. And among these three things I want us to look at, let us look first at the Word of God. Most, if not all of us, know the French atheist and philosopher. They call him Baudet. I'm sure some of us have heard about Baudet. He was a French atheist and a French Philosopher. He was a writer, a famous writer, a very intelligent man who created the first printing press in the year 19, in 1700. He created a printing press and he published many books. He did everything he could do, and his intention was to disprove the Bible. For Voltaire, God did not exist. Just like Jean Jacques Rousseau, another philosopher who said, Religion is an opium of the people. What does it mean by saying something is an opium? It means that is something which people just hide under. He considers religion as something which people just hide under to, to cover up their emptiness. So, Voltaire shared the same impression like Jean Jacques Rousseau. And for Voltaire, he did everything possible on the human earth to make sure that the Bible had no place. But it will be interesting for you to know that at the end of Voltaire's life, after all the emptiness of chasing the wind, when Voltaire died, the same printing press which he published to counteract the Bible was sold over. And that became the first printing press after they printed the Bible. The printing press that opened to destroy the impression of the Bible to destroy, to change people's mind through other literature or believing the scriptures where Voltaire died, his family sold the press to the church. And the church started using that press to print the Bible. And in the first print, over 3,000 copies of the Bible were produced from that same press which Voltaire made to counteract the Bible. That's just to tell you about how powerful God's word is. Take a particular passage of scripture today, reflect on it. Tomorrow, pick that same passage to reflect. If you truly reflect, you will not reflect on the same thing. Try it. Every other day, God's word gives you something new. Every other day. God's word is so big, we cannot understand it. And so this tells us that it is impossible 
like George Washington said, one of the presidents of America, he said, it is impossible to govern the world, the world without the Bible. It is impossible to govern the world without the scriptures. Try it now ever. Twist it now ever. When there is no scripture in your life, your life is empty. If you don't have God's word in your life, your life is empty. And so if you want to walk with God, then we need to begin from the scriptures. How many of us here, consciously speaking, sincerely speaking, how many of us here have time for our Bibles? When was the last time you opened your Bible? I'm very sure that by the time some of us go back home, our Bibles must have been crowded by the Qatar dust. For those who have. Not so. Many of us, if you want to go pick up the Bible after this, you have to feel about carrying out an exercise. I hope you do. Let me show you what you will do. You understand what I'm doing? Because there's dust all around us have settled on it. But every day we have our mobile phones, not so. We are doing WhatsApp, sending voice notes, checking status, and all the like. But there's no time for God's word. So the first thing we need to do if we need to walk with Christ is to have time for the scriptures. You don't need to pick up a Bible and read the whole of Genesis. Open it if you want. Wherever your mind tells you, just pick up the Bible and open it anyway and read something. Some every day try to, try to read something from the scriptures. It's going to help you, it's going to transform your life. For if you look at the second letter of St. Peter, chapter 1, verse 21. It tells us, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by their Holy Spirit. That tells us the importance of the scriptures in our lives. And then the same thing is found in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. From Genesis chapter 1 to Revelation chapter 21, everything written in the scriptures is inspired and is for our good. The Bible will always guide us through life. Like Psalm 119, there's one of five tells us. Your word is a lamp for my step and a light for my path. We qualify that in Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. And the Bible is a source of truth. For us, as John, as St. John tells us in chapter 17, verse 17, sanctify them in the truth. Remember his, his departing words, his apostles, when he was praying, when he had commissioned everything into the hands of God, he told the apostles, he was giving the instructions and praying to God that they may be one. As he and the Father are one, then he asked at the end of the day, he said, Sanctify them in their truth. And that truth can only be found in the scriptures. And the Bible is the only source of information we can get about Jesus Christ. The movies will not tell us about Jesus Christ. If it tells us, it will tell us from a limited point of view. Our friends will not tell us about Jesus Christ. If they tell us, even me, I cannot tell you about Jesus Christ. If I tell you, I'll tell you from how I feel or from my own experience. But everybody's experience with Christ is different. That about that. The second aspect is prayer. How we can walk with Jesus Christ. When I was in elementary school, they taught us about prayer. And the definition of prayer is very simple. Prayer is talking and listening to God. That's all about prayer. Talking and listening to God. It is a dialogue. In the dialogue, two parties are involved. It's a give and take. Now, if I'm dialoguing my brother here, when I talk, not so, I have to listen to him also talk. That's what makes a dialogue. It's not a monologue. Dialogue is about two people coming together. So, in prayer, there is time for you to talk and there is time for you to listen. Prayer is talking and listening to God. But the first thing is that many of us say we don't know how to pray. It's a lie. There's nobody who does not know how to pray. The only problem is you want to pray like this other person. 
You want to do it like this other person has done it. Um, but the idol prays very much. Maybe me, I'm not praying, so I want to be like him. I want to be doing it in his time. No. The simple cash word there is pray as you can. Pray as you can. For example, let me take you in the middle of here in Qatar. If there's somebody who has a job, maybe they offer four hours a, a day. Not so. They go to work four hours a day. That's their own schedule. Then another person has a job that they need to offer ten hours a day. At the end of the day, those two people cannot pray the same. They cannot be the same. Their lives cannot be the same. It is fair that the person who has offered four hours will not be as tired as the person who has offered ten hours. Now the person who has worked for four hours, that kind of person, if the person decides to come to church and lie down before the blessed sacrament and pray for five hours, that's the person's own way of life. The person who works for 10 hours will not be expected to equally come to church and lie down for, for one hour, two hours to pray. By the time you come sit there, you sleep. And you will not say you have prayed. So for you to pray as you can, and for you to pray as you are, is to relate with God as you are. To relate with God as you are. Which means, there are some days in it that you can say long prayers, and there are some days that you can just say one word. God is not interested in the love. He is interested in the commitment with what you say. It is about commitment. It's about how dedicated you are to that one word you say. Somebody can pray five tickets of the rosary in distraction. And another person prays just one day maybe. But that person has prayed better. Look at the story of the tax collector and the, the Pharisee in the temple who went to pray also. Yeah. What did the Pharisee come to do? Oh God, I thank you very much. I pay my tithes. I respect all my, my observances. I give alms. I do not sing. I'm not like that man there. He came to God to sing his praises, not so. Yes. But what did the tax collector do? Lord. Have mercy on me, I'm a poor sinner. And Jesus Christ said at the end of the day, who prayed better? The tax collector, because he was able to tell God sincerely who he is. So pray as you are. Talk to God as you are. In prayer, don't pretend. Some of us come to pray and we pretend. We say what we are not. When I have something burning down in me, then I come before God. Oh God, I thank you for every good thing that has happened to me. Thank you very much. That's no prayer. You are pretending. If you are frustrated with God, tell him you are frustrated. That's what it means to pray. You are talking to your friend. He is your friend. He understands you even the better than you understand yourself. So talk to him as you are. And there's a catch word which summarizes all about prayer. A mnemonic word which I want to use to, for us to understand how we should pray. Probably many times we have been praying wrongly. It's about acts. A, C, T, and S. A, C, T, and S. Properly speaking, that's how a Christian prayer should go. This A, C, T, and S stand for some words which I'm going to give to you. A properly good prayer should follow this order. How short or how long it is, that's how it's supposed to be. And that order is followed by the Father prayer. A stands for adoration. In every prayer you make, you are supposed to adore God. But you want to pray. No matter how short, even if it's one word you say, you begin by adoring God for who He is. Mighty God, you are wonderful. You are excellent. You are marvelous. I worship you for you are wonderful. You got the whole world in your hands. That's one way. You can adore God through song. You can adore God through words. You need to adore God for who He is. Like Revelation chapter five, verse eight to fourteen tells us, and Proverbs chapter five, verse eighteen to nineteen, we call it tell us. After you adore God, you go to the sea. Which stands for confession. Before God, you need to confess your guilt. 
You need to confess your guilt like David did. All of us here are guilty. All of us. There is nobody else does not sin. For some, it may be A, you have sinned. For another, it may be B. For another, it may be C. But all of us are sinners. And so before God, confess your sins before Him. Tell Him how you are. Tell Him where you are born and, and ask for His grace. Then, you can see that in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 3, verse 19, Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13. And then the third aspect, which is a T, is thanksgiving. After you have adored God, after you have confessed your sins, you need to thank God for the gift of your life. Our life should all be a thanksgiving song. No matter the difficulty you go through in life, we are supposed to thank God for the gift of our lives. Because there are many people who don't have eyes to see. There are many people who don't have ears to hear. There are many people who don't have legs to walk. There are many people who cannot stand up like you and I can do. Irrespective of how difficult it is sometimes, we need to thank God. Sometimes we have confessed our guilt, we need to give thanks to God. First Chronicles chapter 6. First Chronicles chapter 16. Verse. And Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, he called it of that. Then the last thing, the last aspect of our prayer is supplication. That's the last aspect of prayer, supplication. That is when we start asking for God. So we also start in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Oh God, please, I need this, I need that, I need that. You are not praying well. You need to ask God only at the end. After you have adored Him, after you have confessed your guilt, after you have thanked Him, before you start making demands. Imagine you are the father of a house. Every day, your child comes to you. Mommy, Daddy, I need this. As you give, the child goes away. Tomorrow, Mommy, Daddy, I need this. You give, the child goes away. And the child does not come up to say thank you. The next time the child comes to ask, will you be encouraged to give? You will not. The child needs to show gratitude first of all for what you have given. And that is how it is in the Christian life. So we need finally, we ask God after we have adored Him, we have confessed our guilt, we have thanked Him, then we ask for gifts. Then He will give us, knowing that we are sincere to ourselves. I know that we are grateful to him. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 to 10 of that. Then the third aspect of how we can walk with Jesus Christ is through an imitation of the life of Christ. We are called Christians. And who are Christians? Christians are followers of Christ. And how can we follow Christ? We consider that Christians try to make sure that they feel. The, the pain of one another, they feel like Christ felt. In their own little way, they try to do that which Christ did. Sometimes we delude ourselves in mediocrity in our Christian life and say, Well, I'm not Jesus Christ, so I cannot do what Jesus Christ did. It's a lie. You can do it. It's just that we have not made up our minds to do what Christ did. Christ has given us everything we need to do what He did. Remember Christ told us that in my name you do greater things than I did. Not so. Christ has said it. We shall do greater things than he did in his name. So why don't we take that challenge and begin to do those greater things? If the John Paul the seconds did it, if when the resident of Africa did it, those were white people, let's come out to Africa. If uh, blessed Tansy did it. You know Blessed Tansy, those from Nigeria also. If Blessed Tansy did it, those from South Africa, you know Josephine Makita, also. If they did it, those from Uganda, you know the matters, Kizito and the rest. If they were able to do it, why can we not also do it? If Nelson Mandela was able to do it, then why can we not do it? We can. We can do it. It's just for us to make up our minds that we want to be like Christ. And how can we be like Christ? Christ 
came for all. Christ did not make selection in the people he showed favor to. He came for everybody. Everybody he saw, he saw God in the person. And we too are supposed to see God in each and every individual we see before us. But the deep and the bitter truth is that we can never relate to everybody in the same way. That is life. It is not possible on earth that I'm going to see one, two, three, four and treat them the same. It's a lie. I must have my own preferences. I'm a human being. I will draw closer to one person than the other. But what we are talking about here is an acceptable amount of understanding one another. So that I'm able to see everybody and see God in that person. Because everybody is created in God's image and likeness. As you see me, this is the best of me God can make. As I see you, that's the best of you God could make. God could not make an individual better than you. You are the best of God's work. And so you will not try to be like another person. Christians respect each other. We are called upon as Christians to respect one another. The respect comes from point of view of our dignity. Because we are created in God's image and likeness. When I see you, I should be able to see God in you. Saints. John Meridiani, I'm sure some of you know the name, St. John Meridiani, who is one of the most stupid priests who have existed in the world, stupid in quotes, stupid from point of view of intellectual capacity. He never succeeded to pass any exam in school. When he was in the same night, he did not succeed to pass any exam. Even Latin was not able to understand. But when the bishop with whom he was living at the time saw him, he said, let's just give this guy a try. He became the best priest in the world. John Meliviani was sent to a place in France called Ars, a town in France, which was we call a lascivious society, called it so. A society in which all the moral values are turned upside down. Nobody respected God, everybody did things the other way. They have sent all the experts in morality, they have sent all the experts in psychology and all that to go and minister to these people. They did not succeed. Now, the superior was sending John Meridiani to us to disprove the fact that he was not supposed to be a priest. So they were sending him there, appointing him to us like, just go there, so that you will and fail, so that we will have reason to, to kick you out. When John Meridiani went to us, because he was working with God, God did it for him. He was able to convert the whole of us and France. John Melvian used to spend 17 hours a day in confession. And when you come to him, God gave him a special grace. When you come to confess, for example, you confess your sins and you don't say one, he will remind you. <coughs> when you are confessing and you talk and talk and talk and there was a sin you committed, he did not say, you say, hey, what about this one? He did not say. John Melvian preached.